In this lecture, we'll be covering the business of America. And the focus question is, who benefited and who suffered in the new consumer society of the 1920s? Calvin Coolidge, president after Warren G. Harding's death in 1923, summed up the presidential attitude toward the economy once when he said, the chief business of the American people is business. Economic expansion, partnership between business and government, and business values seemed greater in the 1920s than at any previous point in American history. After the post-war recession receded in 1920, the decade was one of extraordinary prosperity. Productivity and output skyrocketed as new industries such as chemicals and electronics grew, and older industries adopted Ford's moving assembly line. Automobiles so stimulated economic growth that auto factories, not iron and steel mills, came to embody American industrial power. Car production tripled in the decade. General Motors surpassed Ford, and by 1929, half of American families owned cars. The auto industry sparked the growth of steel, rubber, oil production, road construction, and other economic sectors, and promoted tourism and the expansion of suburbs. In this decade, America's multinational corporations also extended their penetration of international markets. The dollar became the most important currency in world trade, and American industry still led other nations in output. In the 1920s, consumer goods for the first time became attainable by most Americans. Goods made available by credit and installment buying plans like vacuum cleaners, Telephones, washing machines, and refrigerators transformed daily life. Advertising and marketing professionals found new ways to compel Americans to purchase items from the new industrial cornucopia. Americans spent more time on leisure activities, from vacations to sports and movies. Radios and phonographs brought mass entertainment into private homes and birthed a new celebrity culture. A French visitor, André Siegfried, wrote in 1928 that a new society had emerged in which Americans valued their standard of living above all else. Americans' willingness to amass enormous debts in order to purchase consumer goods seemed to replace 19th century values of thrift and self-denial. Work, once seen as a point of pride and skill or collective empowerment in trade unions, now seemed only a means to pursue individual fulfillment through consumption and entertainment. Despite the abundance of mass consumer society, the fruits of economic expansion were very unequally distributed. Real wages rose by one quarter between 1922 and 1929, but corporate profits rose at more than twice this rate, and economic concentration continued, with a smaller number of firms and banks controlling more of industry and finance. In early 1929, the share of national income of the wealthiest 5% of American families exceeded that of the bottom 60%. The majority of families had no savings, and 40% of Americans lived in poverty, unable to enjoy the new consumer economy. Improved productivity allowed goods to be made with fewer workers, and while employment grew in some sectors, such as retail and education, manufacturing employment dropped significantly for the first time in American history. Deindustrialization began in the old industrial northeast, as business moved south to take advantage of cheaper and non-union labor. Farmers were also excluded from prosperity. American agriculture had reached its zenith in World War I when Europe's need for food and government policies had kept farm prices high. But increasing mechanization and use of fertilizer and pesticides elevated output even as world demand stagnated, steadily reducing farm incomes and forcing tens of thousands of farm foreclosures. In the 1920s, for the first time in U.S. history, the number of farms and farmers declined. Extractive industries like mining and lumber also suffered from overproduction in the world market. Even before the 1930s, rural America was suffering from economic depression. The 1920s, however, was not simply a period of decline, but also of significant technological change. The mechanization of agriculture accelerated dramatically, and new inventions like the steam tractor and disc plow encouraged an increase in the scale of agriculture. 
This increase demanded a workforce, and the far west impoverished labor force was mainly supplied by Mexicans. On the Great Plains, extensive plowing and ignoring environmental risks set the stage for the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. Although high unemployment crippled much of Europe in the 1920s, America's high wages, efficient industry, and mass consumption projected a magical image of American wealth and permanent prosperity across the world. The Committee on Public Information's propaganda campaigns during World War I persuaded advertisers that it was possible to sway the minds of whole populations, and many businesses established public relations departments to defend corporate practices and win over a distrusting public. They successfully changed public attitudes toward Wall Street. Congressional hearings from 1912 to 1914 held by Representative Arsene Pujo of Louisiana had exposed the big Wall Street banks' manipulation of stock prices and strengthened popular views that investors were fleeced in the stock market. By the 1920s, however, with stock prices rising, the market gained more investors, and by 1928, one and a half million Americans owned stock, more than at any previous time in U.S. history. With the defeat of the 1919 labor revolt and the dissolution of wartime regulations, business used the language of Americanism and industrial freedom against unions. Some corporations in the 1920s adopted new styles of management called welfare capitalism, in which they offered employees private pensions, medical insurance plans, job security, and leisure programs. These businesses celebrated their attention to the human factor in industry, but more employers adopted the American plan, whose basis was the open shop, a workplace free of government regulation and unions, except in some cases company unions that were created and controlled by management. They believed collective bargaining infringed on the liberties of management and argued that prosperity depended on complete freedom for business. Public relations campaigns linked unionism with socialism and sinister foreigners, and even the most forward-looking companies hired strikebreakers and detectives and blacklisted union members to prevent or defeat unions and strikes. In this hostile environment, unions lost more than 2 million members, and unions capitulated to employer demands in order to prevent their annihilation. Like unions, feminists tried to adapt to the new conservative atmosphere of the 1920s, Suffrage in 1920 ended the ties of solidarity that had united various groups of women reformers. Black feminists now insisted that the movement demand the enforcement of the 15th Amendment in the South, but white activists offered little support. Long-standing divisions between two competing conceptions of women's freedom, one based on motherhood, the other on individual autonomy and the right to work, now took shape in a debate over an Equal Rights Amendment to the Constitution, advocated by Alice Paul and the National Women's Party. The proposed amendment would eliminate all legal distinctions on account of sex. Paul argued that now that women had the vote, they no longer needed special legal protections and needed equal access to employment, education, and other opportunities. But women reformers who supported mothers' pensions and laws limiting women's work hours, which the ERA threatened to dismantle, vehemently opposed the Equal Rights Amendment. Every major women's organization other than the National Women's Party opposed the Equal Rights Amendment. The ERA campaign failed, and in 1929, Congress repealed the Shepard-Towner Act of 1921, which had offered federal assistance to programs for infant and child health. Pre-war feminism's emphasis on personal freedom blossomed in a growing consumer society, and women's liberation became a lifestyle promoted by advertisers and mass entertainment, detached from political or social radicalism. Sexual freedom now meant individual autonomy or personal rebellion, the young single flapper who smoked and danced, sported short hair and skirts, and used new birth control devices came to symbolize the new woman. These new freedoms ceased once women married, seeking freedom within the confines of the home by using new labor-saving appliances.